very frankly, we were lied to, yeah. but it was far more complex than just being lied to. The lies were key, and maybe I'll tell you about one or two of them to show you how key they were, um, but it's far more complex than just people lying to some of the highest uh, cabinet officers in the land, and even to the president, I think. Iran is the real power to be reckoned with, not that paper mache kingdom in Riyadh. So here we are, we're looking at a situation where the long-term security of Israel, I will predict, is in grave jeopardy. In fact, I'd say there's a 50-50 chance that in 20 years, there will be no state of Israel. Wow. That's a powerful statement in my, in, in my view. Welcome to another episode of Independent Thought and Freedom where we have conversations with some of the most interesting people around the world who are shaking up politics, society, economies, and ideas. We've had some amazing guests on this program, including The Saker, Paul Craig Roberts, Sheikh Imran Hussein, E. Michael Jones, Cynthia McKinney, and more. If you'd like to support us to reach our next goal of actually putting together live events where we bring some of my best guests side by side on one stage, please consider becoming a monthly subscriber on Patreon. You'll find the link below. Also, if you are an author or researcher with important ideas to share with the world and want to have a greater impact, I'm offering a free masterclass, three steps on how to leverage your intellectual authority to become a media personality. The link for that class is in the description as well. And now, on to this week's show. Welcome to Independent Thought and Freedom. Matt Taibbi of Rolling Stone magazine has written, The invasion of Iraq is no longer just one of the great crimes of this or any age. It's become a crossroads event in the history of America's decline. One of the most massive and destructive hoaxes in human history, we are still living with the legacy of the 2003 Iraq War. I'm extremely honored to have as my guest on today's episode, Colonel Laurel, Lawrence Wilkinson, the former Chief of Staff of the US Department of State from 2002 to 2005, the former Chief of Staff to United States Secretary of State Colin Powell, and currently a visiting professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary Williamsburg, Virginia. He was the man responsible for putting together the intelligence briefing for General Powell as he addressed the United Nations on the 5th of February, 2003. It's something that Colonel Wilkinson has said many times before in public that he regrets deeply. And since retiring in 2005, I believe it was, Colonel Wilkinson has become an important voice of authority, criticizing not only the war in Iraq, but also of US foreign policy in general. And for his work, he has received in 2009 the Sam Adams Award for Integrity in Intelligence. Welcome, Colonel Wilkinson. Good to be with you. Yeah, thanks very much for coming. I'm, I'm really honored to have you here, as I just said. You know, in looking over your many speeches, your addresses, your lectures, you know, I've seen you use the term stupid wars. Now, given your long history in the Army since 1966, I believe, you know, this seems like it was probably a huge change in your perspective. Did you ever anticipate that you'd come to this sort of view from where you started out? Probably not. Uh, Colin Powell once said when somebody stopped him on the street in New York City and asked him a question, suppose if they'd asked me if I thought I was going to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff someday. <laughs> Could not have answered that question except to say, no, that's preposterous. Um, it's not quite that way for me, though, because as a young lieutenant, I was in Vietnam. Yeah. And as a participant in the Vietnam War from 69 to 1970, after the NVA, the Viet Cong, had been pretty much defeated, and we were fighting regular khaki-clad, red star-wearing North Vietnamese soldiers, um, I had an opportunity afterwards to take a good look at that and what I had done and what my units had done and so forth and so on. So if I were going to classify the 10 years of the U.S. struggle in Vietnam, 
as a war, either stupid or not stupid, I'd have to say it was a stupid war too. But for a lot of different reasons, some of the reasons looking a lot like 2002 and three, for example, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which the Congress authorized President Johnson to up the ante in Vietnam significantly. We eventually went to half a million men in Vietnam. Um, that was a resolution not a lot different from, though it was just one incident, was not a lot different from what we did in 2002 and three in more or less cooking the books, politicizing the intelligence, even lying in order to get the American people to buy the fact we were going to invade Iraq. Um, I think the 2003, as you suggested in your opening remarks, decision was catastrophic in ways that Vietnam might have stretched out over a whole decade and people finally figured out how badly the U.S. had aired in Vietnam. 2003, it didn't take you very long to figure it out, yeah. even the president. Uh, it was November 2006 when he finally fired Donald Rumsfeld and took over the war himself. Uh, but the, the nature of that decision has unleashed all the turmoil that we see in the Middle East today. Not only that, if you're just looking at U.S. national interests, we took out the balancer for Iran. So for whatever purposes you might suggest, we put Iran in the strategic catbird seat in the Persian Gulf area by taking out Saddam Hussein, yeah. which was colossally stupid, just dumb to do that. It was the reason we didn't do it, for example, when I was working for Powell, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we pushed Iraq's army out of Kuwait in accordance with the United Nations mandate and stopped, did right. not go any further. And incidentally, one of the architects of the later war, Vice President Cheney, at that time said it was not worth the life of a single Marine or soldier to go to Baghdad. Later, he would say, 95, as I recall, to have gone to Baghdad would have been catastrophic. We, we, knew, we knew we'd lose all our allies. We knew we would not be operating under the UN mandate anymore. We'd violate international law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the man who 12 years later is the architect of the war in Iraq, the disastrous war. And the only reason for that, in my mind, is money, money, and oil. Wow. Now, you, you, know, you just said just now that uh, from the Vietnam War, from your involvement there, uh, that lying... Uh, was part of the politicizing of the intelligence to, to get in there. Um, and certainly, uh, I know, you know, you've come to that conclusion uh, since your involvement with Iraq. But, but at the time when you were there, I mean, I've read some stuff, you know, like, uh, um, you know, you, you prevented, um, you know, gratuitous attacks on civilians um, by putting your plane in, in the way. And so, so you, you know, you certainly had this, this sense of, uh, you know, moral duty um, and that, uh, um, you know, any sort of excesses and, and war crimes. I mean, you, you uh, not only were in principle against it, but you, you know, you took real risks from, from what I've read, but did, did you, um, did you have a sense from then that there was lying? Because, you know, I, I know a lot of veterans at the time did, you know, participate in the anti-war movement, but, but you, you know, went into the establishment. But it, it's, it's interesting to know, to figure out, to understand what your thought process was at the time. It's an interesting analysis uh, for, for myself, uh, self-analysis, call it. Um, how did I go from being a lieutenant to being a colonel and operating at the highest levels of state power in the world's greatest empire? Um, it, it, it's an interesting uh, progression. There's no yeah. question about it. For me, the, the most uh, valuable progression is the education I got along the way. And I don't mean that just in an experiential sense, although my experiences were important. I mean that also in a very pedagogical sense. In 1982, I was fortunate enough to go to the best war college in the war college apparatus of the United States, the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. It had just been revamped and revised by Admiral Stansfield Turner. Um, and what he had done is bring 50% of the faculty up to what I would call civilian standards uh, right. by making them civilians. 
Yeah. They were from Princeton. They were from Harvard. They were from Northwestern. They were from Stanford, Berkeley, all over the United States. And they were a fabulous faculty. And in nine months of education there, I learned more than I learned in all the education, formal education I'd had before. And what I learned about was management of power at the highest levels of the empire on the earth. Right. Some of it was shocking. Some of it was stunning. Some of it was de rigueur. I mean, you know, you, you, I wasn't totally naive. I knew that empires had existed before from Rome to the Ottomans and I'd studied them. Yeah. But to learn that we were in fact an empire with imperial designs and policies to implement those designs um, was quite interesting for a young major. As yeah, I was. and I, what I find very interesting from what you're telling me is that, you know, um, the military academy is teaching this stuff, not, you know, yes. Harvard or, or you know, New, uh, New York State University or something. I mean, that, that's it's, quite it's, fascinating. It's, it's, it's interesting you say that because right after I left, right after I graduated, um, Yale figured out what Newport was doing, uh, Syracuse and several others, and began to develop, to develop their own, quote, national security curriculum, unquote. Right. And so now you have a number of civilian institutions that are doing that. But this is one place where the war colleges actually led the civilian institutions to do this. That, that, that's really incredible, um, you know, he, and, and it really says something about America, I think, that, you know, although it is, you know, the center of this empire and, and, and we can talk about all the, the negative, uh, uh, you know, implications of that, but at the same time, it's, it's leading institution it has a sophisticated, harsh critique. That, that's, that's amazing. I, 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 I never anticipated that. I, I would have thought it was all, you know, um, anti-communist kind of, uh, you know. Well, you, you, you would be surprised. Um, I recently visited with a student of mine at the George Washington University when I taught there about 10 years ago. He was my student. He's now a Goldman Sachs. He made a very interesting statement to me at lunch. He said, I have never been in a room with a dozen or so of the brightest people on the face of the earth until I got to Goldman Sachs. It is so exciting. It is so intellectually stimulating. Now I'm sitting here thinking, why didn't you go to public service instead of Goldman Sachs? Yeah. But it, what he was telling me was the same thing I felt being in now, I've got to qualify this, at that time, the military leadership. Right. Remember, the legacy was George Marshall. The legacy was Dwight Eisenhower. The legacy was Stansfield Turner, people like that. Uh, Jim Stockdale in the Navy. That was the leg legacy. High ethics, high morality, high character, intense intellectual thought, discussion, and debate, and absolute devotion to the American principle of civil control of the military. Right. But at the same time, not reluctant at all to tell the civilians they had no clothes on, to right. tell them that they were thinking wrongly that they were strategically inept and so forth. Fast forward to today, we have no military leadership like that. One of my gravest concerns about the military today is the civil military relationship because what we have in the military today is sycophants. What we have is yes men and yes women. What we have is people who are brain dead, people with no imagination, no creativity. And I'll tell you right now, the people who would tell you that the quickest or the junior officers, yeah, junior officers who are disgusted with the senior leadership in the military, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, you name it, they don't like the senior leadership. I'm hoping that that dislike won't force them out. They are leaving in considerable numbers. I'm hoping though that some of them will stay and change that over time. But right now we have a we we have a really brain dead military leadership. At the same time, we have a commander in chief who is apt to feel that the loyalty of that leadership is something he can use and manipulate, perhaps even to the detriment of the Republic. So it's very concerning right now that we have a very bad military leadership and in my view, uh, a very circumspect and questionable commander in chief. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, um, I, you know, you've raised these things and, and I, I want to explore them because I think you'll give some great insights. I, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, your father was also he also served 
in the army and, and, and you have a history of your family serving in the military. Is that correct? That's correct. My father-in-law was a tank destroyer in Europe with Patton's third army. And my father was a B-17 pilot in the eighth air force, then the army air force, uh, out of Thorpe Abbott in England. Right. So, so you, so you have that sort of, um, I guess, family knowledge, if you want to put it that way and, and history with it and understanding. And so it's interesting how you said the policy critique was, was very important to you. Um, but uh, so how do you, see, I mean, th there are two things that I'm thinking of about the change, this change in the ethos that you described. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out, and I think your insights would be important to, to this, how that change happened. And do you think it has anything to do with um, the nature of the military going from, you know, kind of draft to, you know, hired mercenaries? Do you, do you think that there's... Uh, some connection and nexus there? I think there is. And uh, I belong to a group called the All Volunteer Force Forum, which is looking hard at the All Volunteer Force right now. Um, we have used the word mercenaries, not in a pejorative sense, but just a descriptive sense, yeah. because that's essentially what we have. Yeah. Less than 1% of 330 million people are bleeding and dying for the other 329 million. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible what we're doing. It's unsustainable, it's unethical, it's immoral, it's unfair. You name the derogative adjective and that probably applies. Um, it's become a facilitator for war. Yeah. It's become something the president doesn't have to think about. He doesn't have to consider that the congressman or the lawyer or the corporate leader having his son or daughter involved in combat somewhere is going to complain or bring political power to bear on the president. No, because these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, they're coming from West Virginia and Mississippi and Alabama and Oklahoma That's and the strange. interior of Maine. 40% of the army today comes from the seven states of the South. 40%. Wow. So this, this is becoming not only a, a, a builder of a civil military gap, what I talked about before with regard to the General Officer Corps, Flag Officer Corps, but it's also becoming one down at the level of the PFC and the sergeant and the lieutenant and the captain. We are building a caste system in America, the military on one side and the rest of the civilian population on the other. And the rest of the civil, civilian population on the other side, it assuages its guilt by going to airports and clapping and yeah. walking up to soldiers, sailors, air marines and saying, thank you for your service, which incidentally, most veterans, I have a lot of them at Women and Mary, most veterans can't stand. They don't like being thanked for their service because they conclude, probably accurately, that civilian is trying to assuage their guilt. Right. for not having served themselves yeah but this is a very this is a very dangerous situation we're building pressure in a pressure cooker with regard to this we yeah. need to change the way we populate the military at the same time i have to say you know if we went to a conscript force and and we actually bit the bullet and and conscripted the, the numbers we should through a fair lottery system with no deferments whatsoever every year um, we would have a formidable military that then might get a, maybe not as often involved in war, but would get a whole lot more of the public involved in the war. And if it were a serious thing, that is to say, we really had our national interests at stake, I'd be a little bit concerned about yeah. how we'd be able to sustain that. Yeah. Um, one of our points at the forum is, what if we gave a war and nobody came? And in that sense, I mean a real war. What yeah. Richard Haas in his book, War of Necessity, War of Choice, mm -hmm. you know, War of Choice, Iraq, stupid war. Uh, the continuation in Afghanistan, stupid war. Syria, stupid. Libya, very stupid. Um, but if you had a war that you had no choice about, um, mm -hmm. you'd be in trouble. We're, we're thinking we would not be able to field adequate numbers to fight that war. Wow. Wow. Let's go to the um, to the preparing of the Iraq War dossier. Um, I mean, you you had a long history um, in the military. You had retired, I believe, in the '90s, and then you had uh, joined uh, Colin Powell, who you had developed this very close relationship with. And um, t t 
tell me about how that was. I, I know you, you've, you've told this story before and you, you, you know, you had the information, you had a lot of questions, people, uh, but you were given, you know, assurances yet, you know, there were still lingering questions. Can, can you go over that whole process of how it was for you to, to do that? Very frankly, we were lied to, yeah. but it was far more complex than just being lied to. The lies were key, and maybe I'll tell you about one or two of them to show you how key they were, um, but it's far more complex than just people lying to some of the highest uh, cabinet officers in the land, and even to the president, I think. Um, it, its complexity involves the kinds of things that Ronald Reagan did, for example. I teach this now, so I'm much more steeped in it than I was before I started teaching it and doing research. Um, Reagan's buildup in the early 80s was not based on really sound intelligence about the Soviet Union. Right. The intelligence in the bowels of the experts at the CIA, DIA, all the intelligence entities of America, and elsewhere too, in France and England and so forth, were indicating what we saw happen at the end of the 80s. They were indicating that the Soviet Union was imploding right. and that Gorbachev was having enormous problems and challenges. That's what they were saying, but that didn't fit Ronald Reagan's need for a massive arms buildup in his first administration. Mm -hmm. So he put Bill Casey out there, some people said a nut already. I think Bill was close to senility, if not insanity. And Bill Casey worked up the portfolio of intelligence for Ronald Reagan that made the Soviet Union look like it was 10 feet tall, thus supporting his arms buildup. Now, you can say no one really died uh, of any great numbers anyway, because of that. But that leads you to think, hey, this is not just the George W. Bush administration that's begun politicizing intelligence, not to mention the Tonkin Gulf incident that we talked about earlier, or the Bay of Pigs in Cuba and so forth. So when we come on it, when Powell and I come on it, I'm not, I'm not as experienced and intellectually informed as I am now, but I was not uh, a raw recruit. Yeah. So I made some big mistakes. I... When, I, when he first gave me the job, I, I literally quit. I wrote out my resignation, I quit. I did it not because I thought this was an impossible task or an untoward task. I did yeah. it because I was sick and tired of being given things like that at the last minute and having to perform in a way that was almost impossible. Right, and right. We had five days and six nights to get ready for this thing. It was, it was, it was like they were purposely setting you up. Yeah, my, yeah, my first reaction was, hey, boss, go back and ask for more time. And he did. And within an hour or two, the National Security Advisor, Dr. Rice, called him and said, no, the president, and we've already made a public announcement. We're not going to go back on it. So I, I wrote out my resignation. My wife taught me out of it. Uh, so I, I said, OK, here's my second mistake. I, I told Powell the next day when I'd convened a group to get ready for it, I told him I was taking Carl Ford, who was our Assistant Secretary for Intelligence, and who had some very strenuous objections to the National Intelligence Estimate that said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons. So serious that George Tenet, the Director of Central Intelligence, had had to put a footnote at the bottom of the 2002 October National Intelligence Assessment, saying that INR, State's Intelligence Bureau, disagreed that Saddam had nuclear weapons, which after all were the most potent things we were looking at. Yeah. So I, was, I wanted to take Carl with me so I, not an intelligence expert, could challenge Tennant and McLaughlin, the deputy DCI and so forth. And Powell said no. Yeah, I know. Carl belongs to me. I know what Carl thinks. I can talk to Carl anytime I want to. You don't have to. Uh, big error on my part. When I got there, I had no intelligence professional with me that challenged George and John and the analysts that they very carefully brought up to put before Powell. Here's another indicator I should have picked up on very quickly and didn't until quite late. Yeah. He only put two, Robert Walpole and Larry Gershwin, analysts in front of Powell consistently. No one else. No dissenters, no arguers, no people who didn't agree with Robert and Larry. So yeah. Robert and Larry hammered the secretary and hammered Condi Rice and Rich Armitage, the deputy secretary of state, and all the others who came to these rehearsals, as it were. 
Um, they, that should have, you know, light bulb should have gone off over my head. Hey, mm -hmm. how come we're not seeing anybody else who might disagree with this? Then come the lies, the abject outright lies. And the one I've talked about most often is the one that greased it, so to speak, with the American people. What were the American people concerned about? 9-11. Yeah, exactly. So what do you want to do? You want to connect Saddam Hussein with Al-Qaeda and 9-11. About the third day, Powell grabs me, literally grabs me. He'd never done that before. <laughs> and he, he puts me in a room in the National Intelligence Council spaces where we were, and he closes the door and he says, are we alone? And I said, well, it is the CIA, boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed a little bit and then he said, sit down. And I sat down and he said, I am sick and tired of this Deuteronomy stuff. And I said, Deuteronomy? And he said, yeah, you know, Muhammad begat Ahab begat... That's all there is. It's so plainly circumstantial and not convincing. I, I don't buy it. I don't buy any of this terrorism stuff and being connected with Saddam Hussein, other than the fact that he pays Palestinian suicide bombers $25,000 for their families. Yeah. That's his only connection I can see, and that has nothing to do with what we're about to do. So I said, boss, I think he thought I was going to object. I said, boss, I think it stinks too. Let's take it all out. He looked at me like, whoa, okay, do it. And when I went to Lynn Davidson, who was sitting at the computer, actually composing the script of his presentation. I said, Lynn, I know this is going to bother you, but take all the crap about terrorism out. And she looked at me and smiled and said, it's not going to bother me at all. <laughs> and she proceeded to do it. Well, I didn't notice over my shoulder was John McLaughlin listening to everything I was saying. Right. He disappeared. An hour later, we resume in the uh, George Tennis conference room the rehearsal. We're rehearsing, and it's pretty rudimentary at this stage, but we're rehearsing. And uh, Tennant gets up and leaves, and I'm thinking, well, this is crazy. The DCI leaving? He shouldn't be leaving while the Secretary of State is rehearsing. Must have an important telephone call or something, okay? So about 30 minutes, he comes back. He sits down, and he interrupts Powell. And he says, and this is almost a direct quote, we have just learned from interrogation of a high-level Al-Qaeda operative of significant contacts between the Mukhabarat, the secret police, and Al-Qaeda in Baghdad, to include the training of Al-Qaeda operatives in the use of biological and chemical weapons, unquote. Powell turned to me and said, put it all back in. That was an abject lie. Yeah. And I didn't find out about that lie until August, three, four months later, when I learned that it was Sheikh al-Libi, that he was tortured, waterboarded, fingernails, you know, all kinds of things done to him by the Egyptians with no U.S. personnel at all present during the interrogations. I also learned that the Defense Intelligence Agency, immediately upon learning that uh, Libby had recanted afterwards and said he would have said anything to stop the torture, that they put out a burn notice on him. When I asked subsequently, uh, sept early September, the CIA, what happened to that burn? I was furious. What happened to that burn notice? It was a computer glitch, they told me. We couldn't find it. When we looked, we couldn't find it. Right. You had a computer glitch with a piece of intelligence that important. It wasn't much better for the mobile biological labs. We said he had mobile biological laboratories, mm -hmm. you know, making biological weapons. Later, this was about uh, end of July, early August, I find out from Tyler Drumheller, who was head of the CIA operations in Europe, that this was based solely on the testimony of a man whom the Germans, the BND, their equivalent of the CIA, were interrogating and declared unreliable. Right. And that Tyler himself had called John McLaughlin and George Tennant and told them that that better not be in Powell's presentation because it was not reliable evidence. Uh, John McLaughlin is alleged to have said, I'm sorry, the train is too far down the road to take it out now. So this is the kind of stuff yeah. that went into Powell's presentation that was not just unreliable. Some of it was just outright, outright fabrication. Now, surely lying in a situation like that is a crime, isn't it? Should be, but look at what's happening today. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I it, it, it may very well be a crime and no one's prosecuted for it, but I, I'm, I'm sure there must be something on the books. You, yeah. you or I would be prosecuted. You yeah. or I would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, but not these pachyderms, these 800-pound gorillas who... Look at the people who 
push the Iraq war the hardest, like Bill Crystal, like John Bolton and so yeah. forth, they're still with us. Yeah. There's no accountability at all. You can fail majestically in this yeah. empire. You can be a disaster in this empire and be resurrected in a year or two. Yeah. That, I mean, that is, uh, I mean, <clears throat> there, there's so many things I want to take off on from, from your story there. And, and s since you mentioned Bill Crystal and, and these guys at the end, I mean, the whole neoconservative uh, clique, I mean, there, there's the neoconservatives, there's the military industrial complex, um, you know, military, industrial, university, congressional, think tank, R and D complex. Right. <laughs> They're all it's all in there now. You know, the empire needs a wide array of contacts and points to go to, and the empire has a wide array. Yeah, and then Eisenhower, you, you, Eisenhower never would have dreamed that what he said in 1961, as he departed the White House, would have come to such full bloom. Right. And you, you've also mentioned um, the role of APAC uh, as well. Um, how, how do you see the, these uh, groups? Do you, do you see them as like one sort of entity or are the neocons slightly different from, uh, you know, this military industrial blah, 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 complex? This, this, well, uh, they use each other when it's handy to use each other. Yeah. Uh, you'll find neoconservatives that are in the military industrial complex. Yeah. And you'll find uh, what I call predatory capitalists who are very angry with members of the military industrial complex like Lockheed Martin, because Lockheed Martin garners $40 billion of profit in a year. And a person like Charles Koch looks at that and says, man, that's $40 billion I could have garnered. Right. Yeah. So there's competition between these various aspects of the empire whether it's the predatory capitalist state on one side or the national security state on the other side. Charles Koch right now is one of the leading voices in this country against endless stupid wars. And the reason is quite simple. These endless stupid wars drain a treasury that he would prefer to drain. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that, that, that's the type of thing I was... Um was interested in, in in your experience because you know as an outsider as an analyst you know looking in we can you know um uh surmise you know the the influence of the neocons and the you know lockheed martins and and the industries and, and all these sorts of things but but your experience uh, at the highest level there um, would you have been in direct contact with any of these people at all, or it, would it be filtered through people like John Dick Bolton. Cheney? John, yeah, John Bolton was our undersecretary for arms control and international security affairs. I had to deal with him. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the quintessential neoconservative. Plus, uh, in my view, uh, I wish I had proof of this, uh, but in my view, a very corrupt individual. Anybody that will take the kind of money that he's taking right now from the Mujahideen of Kak, the MEK, the Iranian terrorist group, right. that indeed was on our terrorist list until we took them off recently. Hillary Clinton, thanks for that. Um, just his relationship with the MEK, to me, makes him very, very questionable. You right. have one of them operating very close to you. You know, well, uh, I shouldn't say one of them, several of them with regard to Caracas and Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, this, this huge failure perpetrated by Bolton and Maurice Claver Cologne and uh, Roger Noriega and Otto Reich and all that crew of neoconservatives. Yeah. Was so, so, you know, Venezuela for them is not really about Hugo Chavez in 2002 or Nicolas Maduro recently is more about Cuba right. because they felt Cuba was being kept alive by Venezuela. Right. Uh, and so that was their way to get to Havana, was through Caracas. Yeah. And this catastrophic failure that just occurred, I mean, I'm told that Bolton and Gina Haspel, the director of the CIA, gave Trump absolute assurance that this recent attempt to overthrow uh, Maduro and to put their man in there was briefed to the president as a slam dunk, just the way George Tenet briefed the Iraq war. Yeah. And what happened, of course, was no slam dunk. What happened was a massive egress from Venezuela, 
tremendous punishment of the, of the Venezuelan people by our sanctions regime, and Nicolas Maduro is still there. Yeah. So this was a cat. I think that's what broke the camel's back with Bolton. I think that's why Trump fired him. Yeah, yeah. I I really believe so. I know. I think this is there. There can be maybe we can say two legacies of the Iraq War that we can talk about. One would be, I suppose, you know, uh, the ones that's perhaps more obvious, which would be things like, um, you know, the, the the devastation and destruction, both of things like the UN Security Council or the wars in the Middle East and the rise of ISIS and, and this sort of thing, which we can talk about. But also another ironic, I think, development is the fact that because this weapons of mass destruction uh, trope that you know you were involved in and, and that you now see, but because it's so transparently wrong that people, I think, just can instinctively and openly just say, like, say in the Venezuelan question, you know, we, we have argued that here, you know, that, oh, well, just like the WMDs, you know, so, so the credibility of the US, because I, I think, you know, for example, one of the big things that it seems to me in this Venezuelan drama that they were orchestrating, because that's what it appears totally to me to be, that this aid truck, that uh, somehow Maduro was going was trying to prevent aid from reaching his people, and that that was supposed to be, I think, what they thought would be the thing that would get public opinion on their side. And oh, it's just like Assad g gassing his own people, and oh, we have to remove this cruel dictator. But it blew up in their face because people just don't believe what comes out of the State Department's mouth anymore. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, well, do I agree 100%. I, I think one of the tremendous, tremendous effects on American power has been the degradation of our reputation in the world. Um, we are, in many respects, a unique empire. We, we do have some aspects to our imperial reign that you could call positive the promotion of human rights in the world, however imperfect it might be at times, um, the, the, the desire for the rule of law to be omnipresent and so forth. These are positive things. Um, we've done irreparable damage. The torture program alone did irreparable, irreparable damage to our reputation. And that, for a country like the United States, that is real power being degraded. And you're right. We, we, I, ha I can't tell you how many Berliners and, and French and British and Japanese and Koreans tell me now what's happened, Larry. Um, we do not understand anymore. And I can tell you they're also hedging their bets now. They're moving slowly away from the traditional alliances, the traditional friendships. They're restricted to a certain extent, as you see with the Europeans and the nuclear agreement with Iran, by the fact that dollar still has so much power in the world and can keep people from doing things that they would do otherwise, right things, I would say, because they don't want to be punished by the United States second and secondary and tertiary sanctions. That's what's happened with the EU, plus the fact they can't get their political act together, and so they seem to be impotent. But we are causing a movement in the world today to balance us. And we're going to rue the day that we started this process because it looks a lot like Athens. It looks a lot like Rome. It looks like traditional empires and how they have ruined themselves in the end by not only damaging their finances, but also da damaging their reputation. You know, in Rome, it was, you could go anywhere in the known world at the time and you could be attacked or you could have a robber hit you on the street or whatever. And if you were a Roman citizen, you knew you were probably going to get redressed. You knew eventually something was going to happen. You knew that the law, rudimentary though it was at that time, was on your side. All, yeah. of, all roads led to Rome and so forth. Well, that's being degraded so powerfully right now for the United States that I think uh, it's fair to say that the name of my syllabus for this semester yeah. is National Security Decision Making in an Empire in Decline. Right. And I think that's a fair description of the United States today. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, okay, l let me take it from, uh, take this angle as well, because I, I, I do want to 
explore the implications of what the you know the war the war against Iraq in 2003 um, had in the world. But one thing I'd like to get your um, input in is the war in Afghanistan. It is incredible, incredible that 18 years later, the Taliban is still there. The U.S. has not won this war. It's the longest war in U.S. history. Um, why? How? What, what, what explains it? And, and what, what does it mean that after 18 years, the U.S. cannot win this war? Uh, there's, a, there's a marvelous comparison between Vietnam and Afghanistan. Um, and it has three very powerful components. I'm not for a moment going to suggest you can template Vietnam and then do Afghanistan or vice versa. But there are three components that are very significant. One is illegitimate government. Right. There is no attitude out in Kandahar, in Herat, or Mazari Sharif, all over Afghanistan, that in Kabul, there's a legitimate government. Right. The view is, there's the United States. That's the same way it was in Saigon, the very same way. There was no legitimate government. There was only the United States. No foreign power in history has been able to maintain that kind of position in another person's country for very long or in a successful way. So that's the first problem. The second problem is sanctuary. You remember in Vietnam, you had Cambodia, you had Laos. You could go away and build a new army. So you could get beaten up like heck tactically on the battlefield, which the Taliban have. But you just go into Pakistan and build yourself a new army and that's come back again. Uh, so that's the second thing. The third thing is there's a real problem with the strategic rationale for being there. I think this is a reason, one reason, that James Mattis was relieved as Secretary of Defense. Mattis conducted a strategic exercise where he looked at what should be the United States presence in Afghanistan and why. Now, you might not agree with this, but as a military professional, I can see the clarity of Mattis's view. Three reasons he wanted to stay in Afghanistan, and they're similar to the reasons that we stayed in Korea, Japan, and Germany post-World War II, and indeed are still there. First, he wanted to not, I mean, this has nothing to do with state building or the Taliban or anything else, except they're ancillary to this presence in Afghanistan. The first thing was to have hard military power in a very, think about being in Germany against the Soviet Union in a very, very difficult area to get into. Ask Donald Rumsfeld. Getting into Afghanistan is extremely difficult. It is landlocked. Mm -hmm. And it, you, you gotta depend on Pakistan, you gotta depend on Uzbekistan, you gotta depend on India, whatever. But yeah. you can't get in there. And air power just won't do it. You can't fly enough supplies in by air. So he wanted to stay there because China's base road initiative ultimately is gonna penetrate big time that entire area. Yeah. So it would make sense to have some hard power around for the United States. Second reason was because you are cheek and jowl with the most dangerous nuclear stockpile on the face of the earth, Pakistan's, yes. at any moment. They're making about 10 new weapons a month now. This is incredible. Yeah. It, this, is, this is a real danger to I, the world. Exactly, because I, just to, to put a little pause there, uh, Imran Khan at the UN just last week said that he would take up arms against India and he was incur and, and, and he was threatening nuclear holocaust on the floor of the UN and he wasn't called out for it. Now, um, th this has been ever since 2002 for me one of the most dangerous flashpoints in the world. In 2002 we had to fly to Delhi, fly to Islamabad and convinced in Islamabad, General Musharraf, then president, and in Delhi, a whole host of people, that they shouldn't have a nuclear war. And we found out all kinds of things about these two nuclear powers. One, neither of them had any doctrine about escalation. Nothing, zero. When we ask simple questions like, if you shoot 20, what do you think they'll do? Well, they won't do anything because we'll have devastated. No, they'll shoot 40 back. You know, just basic stuff like that putting permission, permissive action logs, PALs, 
on their nuclear weapons so that you needed two keys in order to operate them. Simple things like that. Very scary. Very scary. And now you're looking at, as you just said, and the situation in Kashmir, made even worse by Modi's recent actions, um, doesn't behoove uh, any kind of reconciliation anytime soon. So it's very dangerous. So back to Afghanistan, I understand why Matt is going to have something there that can react should that stockpile become, uh, shall we say, very unstable and start going into the hands of terrorists or whatever. Yeah. The third reason, the third reason, and this one you can disagree with, but if you get into a war with China, a real war with China, you want to have a place to operate out of in order to try to destabilize China by getting Uyghurs in Xinjiang province to join you. Right. So call it a CIA operation mounted out of Afghanistan. And I would tell you right now, the CIA would be strategically stupid if they weren't already looking at that sort of thing, given the possibility of a war with China. So I'm being very, very um, yeah. straightforward about the military strategy, but at least Jim had a, a sound way of thinking about it. It had nothing to do with the Taliban. But if you tell the American people that, you have to ask yourself, what do you get? I mean, we haven't told the American people the truth about a war since 1945. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, um, so that, that's really in, incredible because, um, again, th this, is, this is sort of one of the ironic legacies of the Iraq war because I, I suppose it's like there's two types of legacy because it's, it's almost like Afghanistan, very much like Vietnam, uh, is exposing American weakness. And I mean, so r part of Reagan's rise in the 80s was to show that America is strong again and, and so forth and invade Grenada, which is our neighbor here. Um, that's our closest island neighbor. And uh, so, uh, we, you know, we remember that. Uh, but, um, you know, so, so I, I don't... I, I don't know if there's something like that's going to happen in America's future, but I think the, the trajectory is very different than it was in the eighties. But, but so you have this ironic legacy where America's lost credibility. People don't, don't believe it. Uh, you know, when it makes these statements of threats of international threats, uh, it's power is shown to be, you know, not as strong as, you know, or uh, can't say not as strong because you know the bombs the drones the the, the constant warfare is there and, and the death and destruction but uh the defeat is not there and i suppose the american government does not want to admit defeat in afghanistan like it did in in vietnam you know so you have that and on the other hand though you have you know the destruction yeah i i, I think the whole arab spring um the the, the Libya debacle, the, the destruction of the Middle East, all, all that was, um, I, was consequent upon the Iraq war, in my view. What, how, so how do you overall see the effect of, of, of what happened with the deception into war in Iraq and then what was achieved by it, you know, what the neocons achieved by it and, and what was the ironic effects? How, how do you balance all that out in your view? I'd be very interested. Well, to a certain extent, many of the neoconservatives who were focused on Israel, like Douglas Fife, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, who Powell told the president was a card-carrying member of the Likud party. The president looked at Powell and said, you don't mean if I took his wallet out, I'd find a card. Powell said, no, that's a metaphor. His, <laughs> his allegiance, his allegiance is as much to Israel as this the United States. I believe that to this day. Yeah. I believe Douglas Fight, in that sense, very real sense, was a traitor. Mm -hmm. His first priority was Israel, not the United States. There are others like that too. So look at what those people have built for themselves now. They think they've succeeded. They think this chaos in the Middle East, in Southwest Asia, chaos putting Arab against Arab, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Qatar for example, mm -hmm. um, is beneficial to Israel's security. As long as Arabs are fighting Arabs or are having tensions amongst themselves, they can't solidify and go after Israel. Bring the Persians into it, bring Iran into it. And you put the Arabs against the Persians and the Persians against the Arabs and keep that stirred up, then no one in that region can bring its power to bear on Israel. I think it's backfired on them. I think, the, as I said earlier, the putting of 
Iran into the strategic catbird seat, if you will, the real hegemon in the Gulf now, by almost every dimension of real power, geography, strategic depth, population, homogeneity of that population, history. Iran is the real power to be reckoned with the Gulf, not that paper mache kingdom in Riyadh. So here we are, we're looking at a situation where the long-term security of Israel, I will predict, is in grave jeopardy. In fact, I'd say there's a 50-50 chance that in 20 years, there will be no state of Israel. Wow. That's a powerful statement in my, in, in my view. That I is. think that's how badly Bibi Netanyahu and his coterie, his group, the Zionists, and the United States in conjunction with them, mostly the neoconservatives, but the U.S. has gone along. Look at President Obama. What did he say about Bibi Netanyahu giving a speech to a joint session of Congress and contradicting the sitting president of the United States? I mean, how do you maintain an empire with that kind of division within the empire's leadership? Yeah. So you've got a situation now where I think Israel's long-term security is in serious jeopardy. So the neoconservatives have once again shown what strategic morons they truly are yeah and i mean you talk about a dangerous um packet of nuclear weapons in pakistan well this one in israel i think yeah the, the sam the samson option people talk about right yeah. that we, um, need, we we have backed away too from nuclear arms control yeah. we we in my administration abrogated the anti-ballistic missile treaty yeah. Um, this administration has just withdrawn from the first successful effort to curb a whole class of nuclear weapons, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, and we put nothing in its place. And this administration has every intent, I think, to get rid of the uh, strategic arms treaties. So we're building, uh, Obama approved it, a trillion dollars worth of nuclear weaponry and accoutrements over the next 10 years. This is crazy. We're yeah. headed back to a nuclear arms race again and without any treaty structure. Yeah. What we should have done, we, we should have said, okay, let's sit down, everybody. Putin, we don't care about the problems with you right now. We have a bigger issue, nuclear weapons. Let's sit down with Israel. Let's sit down with Pyongyang and Kim Jong-un Kim Jong because we, they all have nuclear weapons. That's let's right. sit down and multilateralize, multilateralize yeah. these treaties. Let's have treaties that impact everybody. Treaties are not perfect, but they're a hell of a lot better than no treaty. And yeah. everybody just building arms and building arms and building arms until the crescendo leads to a nuclear war, which no one is going to benefit from. Well, I mean, your, some of your views here are, uh, you know, amazingly uh, heterodox. Let me put it that way. I mean, it, 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 go, it goes against. Uh, you know, what you normally hear in the foreign policy establishment. And I mean, it's very, very insightful and, and uh, interesting. But uh, so, but that uh, makes me wonder, are, are you a pariah now? How, how are you viewed in, by your former colleagues? By, um, by I the, judge by the emails I get. <laughs> <laughs> I probably get. I probably get somewhere around a thousand on three different systems um, every week, week and a half, two weeks. And I'm stunned that 95% of them, and I keep a little track, 95% of them are positive, supportive, yeah. uh, even suggestive of different things I could do or should do or whatever, uh, some of which are uh, sane, some yeah. of which are not quite sane. <laughs> but there is an entourage out there. There's a solid group of Americans. I'd say it's probably a third right now. It matches Trump's base. Yeah. Trump's base is about a third. So there's a third out there who are informed, who care, and this care is about the environment, about nuclear war, about stupid war, about endless war, about frugality, about frittering away our money on the fringes of our empire, about bankruptcy and so forth. One former comptroller of the United States, former comptroller, said that it isn't some terrorist in a cave in Afghanistan or Pakistan that is going to bring the U.S. down. It's our physical irresponsibility. $23 trillion of debt now, mm -hmm. and $3.5 trillion of it plus owned by Japan, England, Saudi Arabia, and China. That's this right. is crazy. You can't keep, the only reason we can continue to print this money the way we're printing it, quantitative easing, one, two, three, four, so forth, some, by some measures we have put over 
what was it I heard? Seven, eight trillion dollars in the world of not backed by anything but military power money. That's right. The only reason we can continue to do this is oil being denominated, oil sales being primarily denominated in dollars because those dollars make their way back to the U.S. banks and then we can print more. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy what we're doing. Yeah. And we're going to pay for it. And we're going to pay for it too. And when I say we, mostly the poor people in this country are going to pay for it. The middle class and below, they're going to pay for it. Um, just as they did in the 30s, just as they did at the end of the 19th century with the, the long recession, then the Great Recession, 29 to 40. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have got out of that Great Recession if it hadn't been for World War II. And in the councils of government, I can tell you right now, there are people who make these sort of side remarks about, you know, what we really need is a world war. Yeah, that, that, that's frightening. Um, especially with, you know, what World War means today. Yes. Um, it, it was bad enough in World War I and II, but uh, yes. today it's, it's, it's even worse. Now, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, a lot of the, I, which I, I really love. I mean, it's, it's your, your heter, heterodox political views. I mean, you, you know, you, you were with the Republicans um, and, you know, you mentioned Trump's base. Uh, but you know you've you've criticized predatory capitalism. Um, you 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 certainly aren't pigeonholed in in one side or the other uh, from from your statements, and I love that. Uh, how would you describe yourself politically? I'm one of about six Republicans left. <laughs> Lincoln <laughs> Republicans, Eisenhower Republicans, Rockefeller Republicans. There aren't very many of us left. Now let me add that. I've been in all 50 states in the last 10 years. Um, I've been encouraged by the fact that in some of those states, I have found young Republicans, roughly 35 to 45. And usually they're in real estate, investment banking, they're lawyers, they're reasonably successful people, men and women, who are very, very much of my mind. They would love to get rid of Mitch McConnell. They would love to get rid of uh, Trump. They, in fact, I had one tell me the other day from out West who is really angry with the Republicans in his state because they are attacking public lands, trying to privatize them. And that's at the heart of this particular state's tourism industry, which is a big money getter for them. Um, and they're trying to attack the environment in general. And they're big hunters and fishermen. And so they do not like this attack on the environment because it threatens their hunting and fishing terrain, um, particularly clean water in rivers, some of the most clean rivers in America since yeah. uh, uh, 1950. Um, so they're very irritated, but they don't know exactly how to go about it. And so one of the things they were doing was calling me and asking me to come and consult with them and talk with them about what I thought might be possible with regard to getting rid of some of these people. I heard yesterday, that Jeff Flake, you may have read this, Jeff Flake, the Republican uh, Mormon from uh, out yeah. west, Utah, or Arizona, wherever. Um, Jeff said, in response to a question, um, are there at least 30 Republicans who would get energized if impeachment really proceeded factually and powerfully? And he said, oh, probably 35. <laughs> I'm not so sure that is right yeah. if you scratch the, the, the scabs on the wounds really hard and yeah. you let them start to bleed. I, I think Republicans are not quite as stupid as perhaps Mitch McConnell gives off their being. Yeah. Uh, and, and I pick on Mitch McConnell because I think he's one of the most dangerous men in America right now. Yeah. The man stopped. He literally stopped from his position as majority leader in the Senate any further work on ensuring that our elections, principally those in 2020 in national elections, are secure. There is all kinds of legislation pending to do the kinds of things we need to do. If you read the Stanford University's Cyber Center's report, if you read some of the things that are in Lawfare, for example, a journal called Lawfare, um, about what is possible in 2020 in terms of foreign hacking, in terms of foreign interference, in terms of domestic interference, yeah. which I am convinced has happened before. 
in mm -hmm. Ohio in 2004 and elsewhere. It's very easy to go find a race that's very close. All the polls show it's going to be within one or two percent and then get it into the system, the system being the computers supporting the election and manipulate those computers with enough votes to make sure you win. It's right. that simple. Remember Carl Rove on Fox News when they told him that Ohio was going for Obama and he said, that's not possible. <laughs> uh, Carl didn't think that was possible because the fix was in. Yeah. I think what countered the Republicans in that regard was the Democrats figured it out and started doing it back to them. But these studies are showing that this can be done on a scale because we do not have in over 30 states, we do not have really safe and secure election systems yeah. that this can happen on a scale that would be severely disruptive, even crisis making in 2020. You know, let's, I, take, it's, let's take, for example, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at Pennsylvania. The so-called, are you familiar with the term blue shift? Um, that's like going from uh, Democrat to Republican, you mean? Other way around. Other way around, yes, sir. Blue shift. Um, many of the states have made voting, and this is usually Democratic controlled legislatures, they have made voting a lot easier. So you can, like in Virginia, for example, I can go vote right now for the special election coming up in November at the federal center. Or, or the government center. I can go vote. I can absentee vote. They've made it a lot easier. So he, here's what happens a lot of times, and the phenomenon has been more to the Democrats than the Republicans. And Pennsylvania is a perfect spot for this to happen. You would have the election, and on election night, Trump would win by 20,000 votes. But after all these extra votes are counted, he'd lose by 40,000. That's very mathematically possible. Yeah, yeah. Guess what happens on election night? Trump says, I won Pennsylvania. Two weeks later, when all the votes are in, Trump says, fake news, fake news. I didn't lose Pennsylvania. I won Pennsylvania. Guess what? The governor is not the same party as the legislature in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So the governor decides to send one set of electors to Washington. The legislature counters by sending another set of electors to Washington, and you have a continuing crisis in the Electoral College. Right. This is not something somebody just dreamed up. This is a likely possibility. So, mm -hmm. And McConnell stood in the way of making this a little bit more secure, at least in the time we have remaining. Um, he just wouldn't do it. Right, right. Wow. Now, I, you know, with the... Um, it, I'm, it, it's very interesting, all these, uh, you know, little political factions and because the, the system is breaking down in a very interesting and promising way, I think. I, I, I think there are a lot of groups uh, around uh, in, in the American uh, political scene that uh, are very interesting. They're, they're not the stereotypical, um, uh, you know, Dem Democrat or Republican, as you know, has been seen, let's say, in the 80s, 70s, or 60s, or whatever. And um, now, when Trump came up in 2016, I'll tell you from my perspective, uh, I mean, I, I never thought anything of, of Trump before, you know, as a real estate developer and celebrity and, and whatnot. But I could not believe when on stage he told Jeb Bush that your brother lied. Uh, I, and, and when he would talk about the CIA or the FBI or that, you know, we have blood on our hands. And I just could not believe a presidential candidate would ever be saying that on stage, uh, a U.S. presidential candidate. And, uh, and from the Republican side, even, I mean, way more forcefully than, than the Democrats. I, I was just, uh, and, and his, you know, critique of the whole neoliberal global order i i just found that to be uh, amazing and i was fully supportive of it i i don't think the record has uh, fully um you know borne that promise out but uh, that's certainly something that i was hoping <laughs> more would happen that the, the old corrupt order uh, if trump was the harbinger or the guy to do it well you know, God works in mysterious ways, you know, but uh, that, that's, that's the way it is. But what, what's your view uh, of that? I can't say that I didn't have similar thoughts. 
yeah. and was conflicted. Uh, I was conflicted particularly because I had said over and over again that Hillary Clinton could not win the White House. I just did not see it happening. And so you didn't have much other choice. And yeah. I'll have to admit, I voted for Hillary with my nose held and my eyes closed. But I was tempted. I, I was tempted because of the, as you just suggested, the radical nature, the need for change, the need to challenge what is called increasingly the deep state, yeah. the rich bosses of the world, for example, the John Boltons of the world. Um, and so, yeah, th it was enticing. It was enticing. I wish, I wish our system were good enough. And this is part of our problem, the whole deterioration of our election system to have produced a better candidate. Yeah. I wish the person up there challenging Jeb Bush, challenging Hillary Clinton, challenging all the others, uh, was someone like a Dwight Eisenhower or someone like an Abraham Lincoln, someone whom I could really have faith in and, and, and vote for with no uh, recriminations at all. Yeah. It just didn't happen. Uh, and I think what you said about Trump on the stage during the election has become tenfold worse with Trump on the stage for example, suggesting recently that the whistle whistleblower should be shot. Yeah. Um, this is this is chapter and verse with his statement of I could shoot someone in Times Square and my base would support me. Yeah. yeah. Um, these are not the kinds of things that a president should be saying, uh, and I I fully attribute some of the domestic violence, which now the FBI has made a formal statement about their fear of domestic terrorists now equals their fear of international terrorists. And I will tell you that that's quite a public statement because just after 9-11, I had FBI agents tell me their fear of a domestic terrorist, like a Timothy McVeigh or a Unabomber, was far greater than their fear of Al-Qaeda or any other international terrorist. And they explained it to me. They said, look, we are tracking Al-Qaeda. We are tracking Muslimia. We are tracking lashkar e taiba and other international terrorist groups. We don't know Timothy McVeigh exists until the Oklahoma Federal Building blows up in our face. Yeah. That's how difficult it is to go after domestic terrorists. Yeah. Now, we know some of the groups, like the White Aryans and so forth and so on, but the guy who shows up or the gal who shows up and blows a building up and kills over 200 people, we don't know about until the smoke clears. Yeah. So now they've admitted publicly they're as worried. And I think the president of the United States has as much to do with inciting these kinds of people to actually act, not just to be the way they are, yeah. but to bring that being into action. I think he has a lot of responsibility for that. I think we're in an age of hate right now. Yeah. yeah. And then on the left as well, like Antifa, it's yes, just incredible. I mean, you know, just beating people up for wearing Trump hats. And I mean, the, it's, you know, it's, it's really chaotic. I mean, you, you lived through the, the 60s. The, what, how does it compare to then? One of the things that's happened since then is the White House has learned. The executive branch has learned, you know, Dick Nixon couldn't hardly get out of the White House. He was so entrenched and people were all around the White House. You couldn't get out of the White House. Well, now they have moved the barriers out to the point where you can't protest the way you could protest in the 60s. You can't entrap the president, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of other things that are subtle changes made prior to 9-11, but some of them made after 9-11 for genuine security concerns at that time, but they haven't gone away. They haven't gone away at all. One thing Americans do not understand is that all President Obama did was continue and deepen and make more profound aspects of the Patriot Act and so forth that should never have been passed in the first place that impinge on our civil liberties in significant ways. Um, it, they haven't gone away. So there are things now that make it more impossible for the kinds of things you saw in the 60s to happen and garner the TV attention. You yeah. just can't do it anymore. The yeah. permitting and so forth, the places you can go and the things you can do, they're just different. They're very different, very subtle changes, but they're designed to protect the executive branch and to a certain extent, the legislative branch. Wow, wow.
Well, I know I've, I've had you here for a while and I could keep you here for a few more hours, but, but I'll have mercy on you. <laughs> but I, as, um, you know, I'm supposed to be doing something with a gentleman. Uh, my goodness, I forgot all about it. I'm supposed to be doing something with another interviewer. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I, I was just going to, I, I was just going to ask you to, to sum up, um, you know, what, how, you're doing a lot of tours. You're, you're, you know, lecturing at, at university. You're going to be going on Bill Maher uh, soon. Um, what, what would be your main message that you would, that you want to deliver right now, given where the world is and the U S is at the moment? Well, if I had the American people listening to me, I'd say one, you have to give up on this idea that we are a democratic federal Republic. We have aspects of democracy and aspects of a federal republic, but basically what we are is a commercial empire. And we have increasingly since 1945 become not just a commercial empire, but an empire of national security, if you will. Mm -hmm. And the raison d'etre for that is war, military force and war. And as you pointed out earlier, a military force that does not attract the majority of the American people, but just that small group that will continue to do this for you without a lot of objections. And so you need to think hard about whether or not you want, first, to maintain this empire, and second, the methodology for doing so. Because there are other ways of maintaining a commercial empire than hard military power. You can do it with soft power. You can do it with diplomacy. You can do it with economic, cultural, informational, intelligence, other elements of power than the military. Right now, you're doing it with the military. It's going to bankrupt you, and it's going to ultimately turn the world completely against you, and the empire will disappear. And God knows how it will disappear. You have lots of examples. You have the British Empire that sort of found an off-ramp to being a middling power, yeah. You have other, empower, uh, other empires, look at the Soviet Union, that disappeared and disappeared into what is really a kleptocracy with a gas station. <laughs> you've got some choices to make, American people, and you've been ignorant, you've been unalert, and you have not acknowledged all this massive change since World War II. You need to get smart, you need to become alert, and you need to think about what path you want to choose. I'm not dictating any path to you. I'm just saying you need to start thinking because otherwise I haven't even talked about the climate crisis. Yeah. You cannot meet the climate crisis the way we should without cooperation between China, India, Brazil, the United States, the whole world, really. Absolutely. You can't. So we're looking at an existential crisis that is coming on with a vengeance. I mean, just go to Norfolk and see the water in the shipyards. Um, go to Langley Air Force Base and see that their main runways are underwater for a week or two at a time. Go to Fort Bragg and see that in the last hurricane, the Strategic Reserve of the United States, the 82nd Airborne, couldn't move for nine days. This is coming, and it's coming now. Yes, the worst part of it will be mid-century, three quarters of the way through the century, your grandchildren, but we need to do something about this. So Put that on top of what I'm saying to the American people and say, you know, you need to start thinking. You need to start thinking hard. So what, what would you recommend to a young person who's listening to this um, podcast right now? What would be your number one recommendation? Make your first and hopefully your successful objective being a public servant. That is to say, in the Foreign Service, in any kind of, in the Peace Corps, anywhere where you can go and make the situation better. Um, into the federal bureaucracy, into the deep state, and make it better, make it more focused on the kinds of cooperative behavior in the world that I just discussed is essential for us to survive this century. I think that's excellent advice. Well, I, I want to thank you so much, not only for this interview, but for standing for the truth for all these years. You, you've been doing it a long time. I admire your dedication, your sacrifice, and the authority that you bring to this mission. I wish you every success as you continue on your journey. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to make up for all my crimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all for Independent Thought and Freedom this week. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, make sure you subscribe, leave me a rating, like and share this podcast with your friends. Thanks. 
and bye for now.